At quarter past 12 in the afternoon of Monday the 26th of July 2021, Craig, who was an amateur wildlife photographer, was at River Cherwell, near Parsons Pleasure Bathing Place in Oxford. He was there with the hopes of spotting some kingfisher birds. He visited this spot fairly often, but on this day in particular, he stood upon this cement rock and looked around. He was looking for his perfect photo opportunity, but then as he looked down to his left, he saw what looked like a black satchel floating on the water. Now obviously, as you can guess, Craig's a nature enthusiast. The last thing he wants to do is leave debris, leave rubbish in the water that will eventually kill the natural wildlife. So he felt obligated to remove it. However, as he looked around for branches and other things that he could use to get this satchel out of the water, which were just too far out of his reach, he saw the creamy bottoms of some shoes. As he focused on what now looked like the sole of some shoes, he also saw what looked like some cream trousers leading away from them, or at least the seams of cream trousers. But it's not all that often that you find a body while you are in nature. So he didn't quite want to believe it. And because of that, he didn't want to call the emergency services straight away. Instead, he decided to wait for some passers-by so he could get them to confirm that they also thought this was a body. And Parsons Pleasure is quite a common place for walkers. So he didn't have to wait too long. However, the first people to pass were a family, and Craig didn't want to drag children into this situation, so he waited. Luckily, two young men were out walking a dog. He awkwardly called them over and apologised for being inconvenience, but asked them, do you think that's a body? And they confirmed that they thought it was a body, so Craig wasted no more time and got straight on to calling 999. Another family were quickly on the route to that spot, or at least to pass that spot. So one of the younger men went straight down to them and said, sorry, you really shouldn't be coming this way. Go back, find another way. The other younger bloke went to find the emergency services. Well, obviously he didn't go to find them. He went to the nearest road, waiting for their arrival. The fire department were the first on scene. They, of course, tried to get the body out of the water, but they didn't have much luck. So by the time the police had arrived, the firemen were still trying to get the body out. And the reason it weren't that easy, as there were roots of trees and things, and the body were intertwined with that, a rigor mortis had kicked in, so this body were as limp as it could be. That being said, don't get the impression that this water was super deep. It was only half a metre deep at the location it was found. They did eventually get the body out, and it belonged to a male. It was fully clothed, and he didn't appear to have any penetration wounds, or anything like that. He did still have his smartwatch on, but identifying him weren't going to be that easy because he didn't have any ID. In fact, he didn't have a wallet at all. So police got on with their investigation to try and find out who this body belonged to. And they did eventually identify him as 30 year old warehouse man, George Java Martin Carreno. George had only turned 30 two weeks prior and he was one of three triplets. Before we get into this ridiculous case, let's do the disclaimers. This is a true crime case. It involves real people. These real people have families. So although I do want you to share it, and I do want you to comment, please do so with sensitivity. He'd grown up with his brothers being the best of friends, and his brothers, along with his parents, described George as someone who radiated kindness, as well as humour, and spread joy with his wit and courageous curiosity. He was always ready to help, and lend a listening ear to others. His life was full of love for music, photography, climbing and sports. As a Spanish national, he met a girlfriend in Sevilla in 2017 through a dating app. Having studied electrical engineering, George dreamed of making a difference in this world. In 2019, George and Irene moved to the UK and they both got a job at the BMW plant in Cowley, Oxford. They first lived together on Gypsy Lane and then they moved to Barracks Lane. Then after four years of being together, in February 2021, just five months before George's death, they separated. But it weren't a bad breakup. It was one of them kind of breakups where they both want different things, they're both heading in different directions, and they were still very close, they still talked a lot. And I think I get the feeling that they're still kind of in love with each other. They didn't really want to break up, but they wanted different things. They're both heading in different paths. That being said, although they remained close friends, George did move out and move into a house share with two other men. 
Irene had spoken to George on his 30th birthday, just two weeks before his death, that was the 7th of July. He was positive and he was looking forward to the future. So back to the police, having identified George, they now got underway with their investigation of how he ended up in the water. At the scene, there was a bottle of vodka in the water and a lid for that bottle was on the bank. It turns out the last time George was seen was on a night out with his colleagues on Saturday night, the 24th of July. That's 36 hours before his body were found. Throughout the night, George was laughing and joking and he was in his usual good mood. Earlier that day, George had been rock climbing, but they all started drinking in the Swan and Castle. And throughout the night, George received numerous text messages, but he didn't reply to any of them, or I don't even think he saw them, until after 10pm. And when he did reply, he replied to somebody with potential dates of which he might be visiting family in Spain. It was about 10pm that the group left the Swan and Castle and moved on to Cowan Creek Pub on New Road. It was while they was in the Cowan Creek, at about 1am, George received a message from his friend. And this message basically said it would link to a attempted murder in the area. And this friend was basically saying, be careful, it's a really dangerous place, please look after yourself. At 9 minutes past 2 that morning, George said goodbye to some friends and left the Cowan Creek pub. He walked down past Westgate Shopping Centre before starting to run to catch up with some friends. He caught up with them and then the three of them walked down Queen Street. After hugging his friends, George can be seen walking back towards the Westgate Shopping Centre. He was now walking alone and as he walked, he tied his hair back and then he texts one friend saying hello with a question mark. He also replied to the warning about Oxford being a dangerous place with a smiley face emoji. At 16 minutes past three, George was leaning against a wall on Worcester Street. Four minutes later, it was on Gloucester Street. Four minutes later, it was on Gloucester Green. And at this point, he was using his phone to search the internet for his home address and other addresses that he'd lived in. He then tried to call someone, but they didn't answer. So he then returns to searching for his home address on the internet. At 24 minutes past three, George started to move again. He went past Ashmolean Museum before walking up St Giles. It was about 33 minutes past three when George unknowingly dropped his wallet. 58 seconds later, he turned round and walked back past his wallet without noticing it. During this time, George used his phone to access the Badu app, which is a dating app. He then makes another Google map search for his address. He walks toward Radcliffe Square at about 12 minutes to four, and he's still making internet searches on his phone for his home address. Come four o'clock, he'd been sat in Radcliffe Square for about 12 minutes, and that's when an unknown figure appeared. This unknown figure is dressed in all black, black trousers, a black coat with a hood up, and a black rucksack. That being said, he was also wearing a face, face mask, a white one, the time that, bear in mind this is 2021, so a lot of people were wearing them at this time. This mysterious person dressed in black walks up to George. After standing with him for about a minute, they then sit down beside him. At this point, George were on his phone. It's thought that they were on Instagram. And it's said that an arm appears to extend towards George. And the mysterious person has an arm in the backpack. And George holding an item for a period of about 12 minutes before they will both stand up. Depending which route you take, from Radcliffe Square to where George was found, it's half a mile to a mile and a half. Now, let's not forget that George has been drinking for some time. He's searching for his home address on the internet, trying to make calls but people won't answer, and he ain't got his wallet. So George is in quite a vulnerable position. George leaves Radcliffe Square with this mysterious person. They walk up Parks Road, and along South Parks Road. At the end of South Parks Road, they join Marson's cycle path and go down to Parson's Pleasure bathing place. Along that route, the pair was seen on at least six CCTV cameras. George's phone was also pinged eight times along the way. And this route had only been like 1.3 mile. It was 25 minutes past four when they walked along South Parks Road. And as I said, they, you walk along South Parks Road, you down Marson's cycle path. And in fact, the last time he was seen on CCTV was only 200 meters away from where his body was found. George's phone was picked up at Parsons Pleasure Place and his last interaction with his phone, the last time his phone connected to his watch was at eight minutes past five in the morning. The area is apparently known for all male naked bathing 
and you have to walk off the main path to get to it. And I've diverted from my notes ever so slightly via obviously at uh, eight minutes past five when his phone stopped reaching out, that's for to be roughly the time George entered the water. Now, I don't know about you, but I think it's extremely suspicious that this mysterious person finds George, approaches him, sits with him for 12 minutes, then they go for a walk almost directly to an uh, off-street's location, and then George ends up dead in the water, almost straight after the at a CCTV site. But this is where the police's investigation went really cold. And of course, they knew this mysterious person was massively a person of interest. But there ain't much to go on. Now, if you haven't, if you're not watching this on YouTube, if you're listening on podcast or you're cleaning the house or whatever, this person is wearing a black hoodie, black trousers, and a face covering. It could literally be almost anybody. And like I said, a face covering out at night, maybe someone's noticed them. But this is 2021. If someone were wearing a face mask, it, it weren't noticeable because everyone were wearing a face mask. And that's why this investigation went really cold. Thames Valley Police treated George's death as unexplained. They released images of this unknown person from the CCTV for a media appeal. But no one came forward, so they still couldn't find an identity. The coroner gave a narrative verdict for George's death, immersion with alcohol intoxication. Just for those of you that don't know, a narrative verdict is basically, instead of just stating that was the cause of death, they go into more detail, a lot more detail. This kind of verdict is often given when the cause of death is complex or if there's multiple factors. In this case, I don't think the coroner really knows what the exact cause of death were or why that was the cause of death. So he explained a lot about it rather than just saying this was the cause. Anyway, the conclusion of immersion with alcohol intoxication was recommended by a forensic pathologist. And this pathologist had also noted bruising on the left side of George's body, his head, his neck, and his shoulder. Correction, it was his back, not his neck. But there were bruise marks around the top of his neck. I don't, I don't, I don't know why that's not in the note. Dr. Brett Lockyer, who performed the post-mortem, said the bruises could represent injury from a third party or could be accidental from a fall. The toxicology report said that George hadn't taken any drugs, but he was 1.8 times over the legal drinking limit. To be more specific, his blood ethanol level was 140 milligrams per deciliter. Dr. Lockyer told the inquest, drowning is a difficult post-mortem diagnosis to make with certainty. It seems reasonable on a balance of probabilities that the death was due to immersion with alcohol intoxication. He also added that there was a possibility that the injuries could have been caused by a single blow to the head and that someone could have held him underwater. The leading investigator added that he couldn't rule out any third party involvement, but he'd done everything he can to try and identify the witness. The coroner closed the inquest by saying, I'm going to conclude the inquest, but not with a finding of side of Isue, though an accident is the most likely explanation in the absence of any third party involvement. I'm not going to deem it an accident, in a sense, it's left a bit open-ended, but that reflects the fact we don't have important evidence about what actually happened and how George ended up in the river. Unfortunately for many cases, that's where this case would end. It would forever be a cold case that's classed as an accident, and there'd probably be videos on YouTube talking about what happened to George. Fortunately for George's family, fortunately in the name of justice, that isn't where this case ends. Almost a year after George's death, when the inquest closed, his family pressed the police. They wanted them to carry on with the investigation, to carry on trying to find this unknown person, because they had to have had something to do with George's death. His mum Mary said, I feel we need to keep investigating. We need to keep sharing the footage so we can identify the witness. To me, it's not clear that enough has been done on social media. At the moment, there is lots of unknown facts, and ambiguous interpretations of the situation. We really have to find the answers. We need to know where, when, how, and why this happened. There's lots of unanswered questions, especially the 30 minutes unaccounted for in the last CCTV footage. I think that's due to the lack of evidence. We need a further investigation, more detailed and in depth to find the answers. 
However, the leading investigator responded, saying he didn't know what else he could reasonably do. We could keep going on forever. We could keep going forever and ever and never establish who this person is. In my heart of hearts, I know I've done everything I can with my lines of inquiry. If any lines of investigation come forward in the future, I will investigate it. It's really going to play in my mind. My thoughts will remain with you and your family for the rest of time. The coroner told the family that he'd press the police for another media appeal. And that's exactly what he did. So a few months later in October 2022, Thames Valley Police went to the media once again with fresh CCTV footage. Obviously this wasn't fresh to the police, it was just different footage from what they'd shared the first time. Again, they was appealing for information on this mysterious unknown person in the footage. And again, that's where this case stopped. Just another cold case that may or may not have been an accident. Or at least it was, until the police received a report from someone living in America claiming they knew who the person in the CCTV was. So the police flew all the way to Colorado in America to take a statement. And although this is without a doubt the most pivotal moment in the entire investigation, the witness turned round and told the police they were too mentally damaged to give evidence in court because they suffered from PTSD and other conditions. So their statement couldn't even be used in court. It's now been over two years since George's death. And in the public's perspective, it was out of nowhere when on the 9th of August 2023, the news broke that a woman had been arrested by Thames Valley Police. The police started doing door-to-door -door inquiries on Crutch Crescent and a house had been cordoned off. The police were going around saying that this house would be cordoned off for a number of days. And at this time, the police still had the public stance that George's death was unexplained. They were keeping a very open mind, but they had arrested a 25-year-old woman in Oxford on the suspicion of murder due to new information that they'd received. Days had passed and the police were still questioning this woman and they were still searching her house. They'd been granted 30 hour extensions in order to question the suspect, but they were now against the clock. You see, the thing is, the police can only arrest you and question you for a certain amount of time. After that, they have to ask for a 30 hour extension from, I don't know what level it is, but from the powers that be, and then after that 30 hours, they have to ask for one more. They can only be granted two 30-hour extensions. And the clock were really against them. It was now the fourth day, the 13th of August, 2023. The dangerous 26th hour was approaching real fast. But that's when the police charged Scarlett Blake with murder. Thames Valley Police revealed that Scarlett Blake who were formerly known as Alice Wang, had also been charged with causing unnecessary suffering to an animal, criminal damage and theft, but stated that them charges were completely irrelevant to George's murder charge. So let's rewind, go back in time and figure out who the hell Scarlett Blake is. On the 18th of February 1998, Scarlett Blake was born in China as a male with the name of Fang Wang. Scarlett, and that's what I'm going to call them, because that's what the judge called them, and trust me, this case is already complicated enough without going into the politics. Trust me, it gets a lot more complicated. Anyway, with her parents, Scarlett emigrated to the UK in 2002 at the age of four. They first moved to London, so her mom could study cardiology on a scholarship. They then moved to Oxford in 2006, when her mom got a job. The neighbours described Scarlett's mom as a wonderful person and very professional. Now, I'm not sure if Scarlett's dad ever lived in the UK for any length of time. However, at this point, he's living in China and working as a doctor. It was at the age of 12 that Scarlett came out to her parents as trans. According to her, coming out made her dad really unhappy, as well as her mom, and it caused a large emotional rift between them. Of course, she then started going by the name of Alice Wang and eventually moved on to Scarlett Blake. She grew up in a detached bungalow in Marston's village on the outskirts of North East Oxford. Scarlett was an only child who spent most of her time tinkering with engines and restoring second-hand cars with her friends in the garage. While at school, Scarlett was in the army cadets. And again, her neighbours from Marston remember Scarlett being a quiet child who was doted on by both her mom and her dad. One neighbour said... Scarlett was bullied at school because she was trans, and that led her to leaving halfway through sixth form. 
We used to see her with friends tinkering with cars in the garage. She was always very pleasant, but there were times where the police would be called to the house. Her mum came here once to say she'd been harming. She was very upset. At 17 year old, Scarlett started to receive blockers of the puberty type. And then at 18, after a referral to the Tavistock NHS clinic, she started receiving hormone treatment. That isn't the only medication Scarlett was on though. As a child, she'd been diagnosed with depression and she'd been on that medication ever since. Now, there's a lot that Scarlett claims about herself, especially when it comes to conditions of her mind. She claims to have dissociative amnesia and she says that she can scarcely remember anything from before the age of 12, but this hasn't officially been diagnosed. Another claim that she makes is that she's got a fragmented personality and she likens that to a pie chart saying that she uses different personas for different moods and scenarios. For this, Scarlett used many names. Apparently there are at least six different names, including Scarlett and Candy. But one of these fragmented parts of the personality include the personality of a cat. And this cat personality she used to use to express joy, to the extent that she'd even greet her friends that knew about it by meowing at them. It's also claimed that Scarlett is a chronic insomniac. She'd often go walking around Oxford late at night. And she herself admits that she's got a habit of drinking excessively. And she'd been known to use recreational drugs. Or substances. It says substances, so we should stick with that because theoretically they're not the same thing. She wanted to study medicine, but since dropping out of Cherwell School 6th form, she didn't get her grades, so that went out the window. But with her fascination of human anatomy, it was always her ambition to become a doctor. Later on in the timeline, she had the contract for a job as a medical technician at Oxford University, but that never got started. And at the end of this case, Scarlett was apparently volunteering for the Samaritans. Describing the Chens as a private family, neighbours said, we never had any troubles with them. We knew the mother was doing the best for her daughter. During the pandemic, while perusing around an online forum, which focused on gore, Scarlett met Ashlyn Bell. Now, there's a lot to be said about Ashlyn. She's a trans woman in the US. She was apparently a sex worker who charges $100 per hour. She has a collection of military items, including a small gun collection, a bulletproof helmet, and a collection of Nazi memorabilia. As I said, they met on a go forum. And on this forum, Ashlyn Bell's username was Murdermutt. Apparently, due to her interest in murder, and seen herself as a mutt. Scarlett used many different usernames, one of which was Blood Moth, which is apparently a metaphor for her obsession with blood and her attraction to damage like a moth is drawn to the flame. Scarlett and Ashlyn talked a lot. Most of them conversations were through Signal or Discord, which are encrypted message services. Eventually, they went on to form a long distance relationship. However, as you'd expect from a relationship that spawned from a goal website, their relationship entailed a lot of sexual violence in the form of images, videos, and roleplay. In one message, Scarlett said to Ashlyn, I'm borderline psychopath. I love death. Lol. There were numerous videos where Scarlett would cut and even put a noose around her neck. Here's some more messages from between the pair. Early on in their relationship, Ashlyn said, I have big dead girl eyes. Scarlett, you assume I prefer alive eyes? Ashlyn, yeah, my eyes legit freak people out. Scarlett, I love dead eyes. On the 6th of December 2020, Scarlett said, Oh, fuck you. Ashlyn replied, Choke yourself and pretend it's my hand. Scarlett, How do you want me to do it? Ashlyn, So you get all fuzzy headed. Scarlett, I never knew how to do it, but I'll try. Two weeks later on the 20th of December, Scarlett said, Ashlyn, I was super homicidal earlier. It would have been super nice to kill for you. On the same day, Scarlett, I would murder my mom for you. I also want to kill my dad one day. Ashlyn just simply replied, I understand. Scarlet, they didn't make me into who I am. Maybe when they're old, I can just put a respirator with pure nitrogen on them while they sleep. On the 20th of January 2021, Scarlet put I'd <coughs> that word that means non consensual in that, beat you down on the floor. Ashlyn, come up from behind me and punch me in the back of the head and tackle me down. Scarlet, yep. Yeah. Oh, just put rope around your neck and choke you first. Good luck fighting back while you're unconscious. Keep you in that twilight, where you can do nothing as your body twitches. At some point, Ashlyn said, When I visit you, can you help me get my first kill? You will give me the courage and help me. Scarlet, yes my love, I would love to be there with you. Ashlyn, 
Can I be the one to finish them? I want my first blood. Scarlet, of course you can. Ashlyn, after they pass out, I want to make out over their corpse. Scarlet, hot. Unfortunately, it wouldn't become apparent until it was far too late that the things that were said and done in this relationship were far, far too disturbing. I mean, extremely disturbing. There's a lot more messages transferred between the pair, but we'll leave them until later. Things massively escalated in 2021 when Scarlett gave Ashlyn one of the most messed up Valentine's presents ever. She'd started preparing in January 2021 when she bought a humane cat trap from eBay. She then went to try and catch a cat. Apparently she first tried baiting the cat into the trap with tuna, but that didn't work. She then went online and bought 100 pouches of cat food. She then used that to try and catch a cat, but it still didn't work, so she moved the trap somewhere else, and eventually she ended up catching the next door neighbor's cat. It was at some point near Valentine's Day that Scarlett and Ashlyn had a four hour long video call. Now, through my research, I know far, far too much detail about what happened in this video, and I would like to tell you every last bit of detail, because God knows it is in my notes. Although sometimes there's a limit to what people want to know and there's also a limit to what YouTube will let me say. So having trimmed a lot of the detail out of this section, during this video call Scarlett was wearing a gas mask and some gloves. She proceeded to tie it up by its neck with ribbon. However, that weren't an attempt to kill it. Oh no, she kept it alive for at least three minutes. In short, she tortured it, skinned it and worse. Once it had gone, she dissected it and put it into a blender. As I said, there is a lot more detail, but it's absolutely horrific and I really can't tell you. This ordeal went on for over 20 minutes. And during that 20 minutes, which she recorded by the way and stored, she laughed 29 times. And she was also consistently smiling throughout the footage. Not only that, but she was posing with the corpse for pictures and pulls into the camera and not just the corpse but parts of the corpse like at one point she paused with the head during the video there was a lot of things said and i think i've got a recording so depending on how bad it is i might play it i might not now one day i want to learn how to do this to a person <laughs> just in case i don't here's what some some of what said in the footage here you go my little friend Oh boy, you smell like shit. I can't wait to put you through a blender. It was worth it. Oh boy. Good song this is. I just ripped this. No, that's connected. Well, I wonder where I learned to do this to a person. My hands are shaking. I fucking love it. Look at that little bastard. I'm pretty sure he's still alive. Now, I'm not sure if it was Ashlyn or Scarlet, but one of them said, next time, a 45 degree angle. Practice. Ashlyn said, I expected it to splash a bit more. Scarlet, yeah, me too. I'm going to take the scalpel. Referring to the Netflix show Don't Fuck With Cats, Ashlyn said, you know he started out killing cats, right? Later on, one of them said, so tragic, nothing's innocent. Ashlyn, this is the best Valentine's ever. I've got my stimulus. Scarlet, that's really easy. It's a really fucking pointy blade. Yeah, this is exactly what a scalpel is for, by the way. Oh, that's cool. A cat is. Well, that's an animal. Every animal is like that. The music in the background stopped playing. Then you could hear typing. And then Scarlett said, I think I'm starting to get this now. I wonder how much longer I have to do this. One of them said, damn, that's cool. Scarlett said, something does not smell very good. Oh, who's a cute little kitty? Ashlyn said, can you send me a photo from your phone of you holding it in your hand? When this awful ordeal was over, Scarlett kept the heart as a memento. And as I mentioned, during this video call, a song was playing in the background, on loop. It was True Faith by New Order, and it's claimed in court that that was a nod to, again, the Netflix show Don't Fuck With Cats. Although Scarlett would later claim, Ashlyn had an interest in the movie American Psycho, and there is a scene where Patrick Bateman kills a colleague with an axe, and that was in the background. I knew she would enjoy it, so that's why it was on a loop. In the days after, Obviously, neighbours were missing the cat, didn't know where it were, so started to put posters up around the area, looking in an appeal to find the cat. And Scarlett revelled in this. She even took pictures of the posters. The astute of you will have noticed 
that this was four months before George's death. So four months later, in the early hours of Sunday the 25th of July, just six days after lockdown rules had been lifted, Scarlett sent Ashlyn what since been described as a dark and menacing selfie. In the selfie, she was wearing a black combat jacket, which is what she's seen wearing in the CCTV. She left her mom's home on Crotch Crescent at about 28 minutes past two in the morning. At about 35 minutes past three, she's said to have walked past Linacre College on St. Cross Road. It's 17 minutes to four, Scarlett walks past the Lamb and Flag on St. Giles before pausing at Ship Street at 10 to four. She then walks onto Corn Market at seven minutes to four, where she pauses again. She then goes onto Hill Street and out from Toll Street at four minutes to four. At one minute to four, she's looking down Kate Street. And of course, it was at 4 a.m. when this mysterious figure that we now know is Scarlett Blake enters Radcliffe Square and starts to interact with George. 12 minutes later, they leave the square en route to Parsons Pleasure with vodka in hand. It's still unclear what happened once they got there. However, Scarlett obviously insists that she'd never touch George, she didn't do anything, and it was nothing to do with her. However, it's suspected that she hit him over the head with a bottle of vodka and then used a homemade garret to strangle him against a tree which he relent on. Once he'd fallen unconscious, she pushed him into the water and it was being unconscious in the water that caused his death. That was shortly after 5am on Sunday the 25th of July and it wouldn't be another 17 hours till George's body were found. After the discovery, all the time, Scarlett returned to Parsons Pleasure at least twice and took pictures of the scene. Now, I'm not sure if it was before or after George's murder, but Ashley sent Scarlett a message that read, you get another kill before you get here, and then you can chill, and I will officially have a serial killer, big booby girlfriend. Scarlett said, I will see about it. Ashley said, don't forget to work out and practice more. Scarlett said, yep, will do. After the murder of George, Scarlett then sent her jacket that she was wearing, the combat jacket, over to Ashlyn in Colorado, America. And yes, when I said sent it, I meant she literally posted the jacket over to her. When she received the jacket, Ashlyn messaged her saying, your smell immediately turned me on. Serial killer musk, serial killer musk, serial killer musk, serial killer musk. Then, for a time in February 2022, Scarlett and Ashlyn broke up. They did get back together, but then they broke up again. And about a month after their last breakup, Scarlett got herself a new girlfriend called Eva, who also happened to live in America. And if you want to know about Eva, fine. Again, Scarlett's texts tell you as much as you need to know. Scarlett, bitch, I kill people because my lover said it would be hot. Last time I found someone this drunk, they died. Eva, oh yikes. Scarlett sent her a picture of the back of a mail. Eva, do you think he's going to be okay? Scarlett. Yeah, he's safe now. He's left my room. Scarlett's text making light of murder weren't the only thing that carried on from their past relationship though. Scarlett had videos of Evie strangling herself and when she was asked about them, Scarlett explained to the court that that was typical of the type of pleasure activities that they got up to. Evie was living in Florida when they got together and at the beginning of 2023, Scarlett went over there. She spent roughly three months in America and then Evie came back with Scarlett to the UK for about six months until she got arrested in August. Now I know that don't quite add up. August is six, uh, August is three and six make nine. It's Scarlet's timeline, so I can't be fully sure on where the extra time came from, but I think it's a little bit irrelevant. And you're probably thinking this is all irrelevant to how Scarlet got arrested, but it's not, bear with me, we're getting to it. In the months that Scarlet and Evie were together, there were plenty of bumps in the road as you'd expect. At one point, Evie recorded herself crying, and she said that she was worried that Scarlett were going to try and kill her. I don't think I've ever been this scared of her. I don't know what I'm supposed to fucking do. She's probably going to try and kill me. I guess if anyone actually ever finds this, it was her, and if nobody finds it, I'm okay. In a message Evie put to her mom, she said, Scarlett just started going off on me, crying and screaming, and showing signs of aggressive body language, so I left. She then texted her mom shortly after saying, small update, everything's okay. But there were lots of troubling signs before they even left America. They were first in Florida, because obviously that's where Evie lived, so Scarlett went straight to her. They then went to South Carolina, and then they went to Colorado. Now, for anyone that's not entirely clued up on those locations, 
from Florida to South Carolina, central to central, it's about five, 600 miles. But then from South Carolina to Colorado, it's about 1,600 miles, which as a Brit, that is absolutely mind blowing because our country is not even that long. Now, you might be interested to know if you haven't already clicked on that Colorado is where Ashlyn lived. And that's where all this goes terribly wrong for Scarlett because Ashlyn really didn't take to Eva. According to Scarlett, Ashley was convinced Evie was going to hurt me, mentally. She was convinced Evie was bad for me, and Evie was convinced Ashlyn was going to abduct me and not let me leave. They were intense, but things didn't get any better. One night in Colorado, Scarlett and Ashlyn had been out for drinks for Ashlyn's birthday. After we got back to the apartment where we were staying, Evie wanted to talk to me, so we left for a few minutes. She was talking about how Ashlyn was dangerous. We agreed after we leave, we wouldn't make further contact. When we got back, we found Ashlyn further back in the apartment, pointing a rifle at the door. Now, I'm not going to go into a lot of this. Scarlett did go into a lot of detail in the court about this section. And although I like to give you as much detail as possible, and I like it to be as unbiased as possible, Scarlett's view is very much, I blocked either. I stood in front of her. She portrays herself to the hero and all that kind of shit. And like I said, I like to be unbiased, but we've only got Scarlett's account for that. And I'm really not going to give her the gratification of playing hero, especially not in this story. And to be fair, I've been unbiased by telling you that. Top and bottom of it is no one got shot for a big verbal argument and a scuffle in which Scarlett apparently got a broken rib. Scarlett also went on to say that after that, they'd been scared of Ashlyn with a gun. So they came back to the UK immediately. She said immediately. Although during cross-examination, that changed. She was like, no, we didn't run. We weren't scared. We didn't leave straight away. It weren't like we packed our bags and left. So again, we don't know. But she did come back to the UK shortly after. Now, again, this is, I, don't, I you know me, I only like to put facts in my videos. But I can't help theorise here. Because if you remember back earlier what I was saying, Ashlyn were asking Scarlett, to help a murderer, someone help, be there and support her and help her get her first kill. So now I can't help but wonder why Ashlyn and Eva went to Colorado where Ashlyn was. Why would you take your new girlfriend to see your older girlfriend? Now this theory only deepens when you realize that Scarlett told the court Ashley was stating that I intended to murder Eva. You know what I mean? Maybe, it might just be my head, but maybe Ashlyn had it in her head that Scarlett had brought Eva as a victim, as a gift. It was all a plan, according to Ashlyn's head. Or even worse, this were an actual plan. They actually decided this and they'd got there, but then at this point Scarlett didn't want Eva to die. She wanted to stay with her. Like I said, that's just my theory, but it all seems a bit weird especially with Ashlyn thinking that. Either which way, after the time the three of them had spent in Colorado together, it didn't end well. And that's what made Ashlyn decide to phone the police and report Scarlett as a person in the CCTV. It was purely out of spite. But that isn't the only thing she told the police. She didn't just say, oh yeah, it's that person, go and do some investigating. Oh no, she even told them how Scarlett had claimed to have done it. And of course, Scarlett had told her that she'd hit George over the head with a bottle of vodka, then used the homemade garret around his neck while he was sat against a tree. And apparently she then checked to see if he were dead. And she tried to break his neck or remove his head, but she then decided to just push him into the water. And regardless of whether this report was out of spite, regardless of whether it was true or not, Ashlyn pled not guilty to George's murder. In fact, she said that Ashlyn had wanted her to murder someone for their mutual sexual excitement and gratification. So when the news that came out about George's body, she decided that she'd tell Ashlyn that yeah, I did that and this is how I did it in order to get the false credit for George's death. Which alone is sick. Even if she didn't do it, pretending she did is still extremely wrong. So let's get on with the arrest and the court case. First of all, when the police got to her house, they asked her if she had any harmful chemicals 
in the home before officers entered. Scarlett responded by saying, that's an extremely difficult question to answer. Going on to say that she had different types of acid. Two different types of acid. And again, when she was charged with the murder of George, she replied by saying, at least it's not genocide. I've actually got a clip of the arrest, so I'm gonna put that on now. They, they can do that, so what we've got here is we've got a healthcare professional, um, so basically a nurse at custody. If you're, for instance, you need nicotine, then I think they've got those. In court, she was asked why she made that comment, at least it's not genocide, and she said it was reference to legislation passed in Florida which allowed transsex offenders to be executed. After being arrested, she was interviewed 11 times, and she made no comment throughout. However, Scarlett wasn't mute throughout. Hours after being arrested, Scarlett, who let's not forget, identifies as a cat and meows at friends as a way of a greeting. She blurted out to police officers after an interview that she'd been chipped. Obviously, the police were stunned, and she explained that she'd got an animal chip in her chest. Obviously, the police were very skeptical initially, so they went and got a machine reader, and they were amazed to discover that she did indeed have a microchip inserted in her chest. She added, Well, my details are registered on an animal database. Although she pleaded not guilty to the murder of George, she did plead guilty to the murder of the cat. And let's face it, she had no choice. The police had the full video of her doing it. The trial was expected to last up to three weeks in Oxford Crown Court, but it actually only went on for eight days. And obviously because the police couldn't use Ashley's confession, they were desperate to find as much evidence against Scarlett as they possibly could. And when they searched her house, they found a trove of evidence. Regarding the video of a cat, they found a box of surgical blades, a scalpel box, two fluorescent tubes, a diary entry with a bladed scalpel, a Blendtec blender, a tripod, a scalpel blade with a red stain, reflect photograph tripods, a black ribbon on a roll, the cat trap and food. Other things they found included a black bag similar to the one she was wearing in the CCTV on the night of George's murder, headphones, a microchip reader, boots and a jacket. Let's not forget at the scene there was the bottle of vodka and the bottle lid that was found on the bank also had Scarlett's DNA. The police also seized two phones, although Scarlett refused to give a pin number but officers did manage to access one of them. And through accessing this phone or them phones, they retrieved a lot of digital evidence. I've already read you a lot of the messages that came from the phones. However, they couldn't access a Discord account. And that would have had a trove of evidence on, because as we've said, it's one of the main ways she communicated with people. And the prosecution even asked her again for a password during the trial, to which she was refused and suggested that the police use the same method that they did to get into a phone. No, but you got in anyway, so why can't you do that with this? I'm assuming if you didn't, it means they aren't relevant. The prosecution pressed, last time, are you going to provide that password? Scarlett, no, I'm not legally required to do so. Before we get into the texts, some of the first ones are with someone called Chloe. Now, Chloe is a friend of Scarlett's. However, she's also a therapist by trade. I don't think it's Scarlett's therapist, but she's still a therapist nonetheless. Scarlett, I was telling him how I like being dead and stuff and how me and my girlfriend are planning it. Chloe, planning what? Scarlett, like dying together and other kinky stuff. In a separate set of messages, Scarlett, how do I open up with ending up in a psych hole? I went to a sexual health clinic and ended up at the JR. Chloe, it's a tricky one. I would never encourage someone not to open up with a therapist. Scarlett, I have no fucking idea what spectrum I need. Necro is sex. Chloe, I would say a sexologist with an interest in forensics or knowledge about paraphilias. Back onto the messages with Scarlett and Ashlyn. On the 23rd of March 2022, Scarlett sends Ashlyn a picture of a cat covered in a red substance. An ex, who I don't know but I assume is Ashlyn, asked, Do you know any other killers? 
Scarlett responded, Not really. No. Why? On to messages with Eva. Scarlett sent Eva a message that read, Literally everyone is apparently worried about me whenever I talk about anything personal of the Samaritans. Every medical professional I told is asking me if I'm sure. I feel confused, so I keep laughing. In a manic psycho way. God, I want to open him up. Like my little cat friend. I want to see him struggle. I want to see the fucking despair. Fuck, I need blood. This is bad. What if I'm bipolar? Eva responds, Who knows? I do know you're hot. Please do not kill anyone except for me. Scarlet said, I won't, dear. I'm meeting the chick soon. I'm going to see if she wants to bite the shit out of me. And it weren't just texts that were found on Scarlet's phone. There was a cartoon image with a woman with a rope around her neck and the caption saying, First time. The police also found the image of the homemade garret, which had been made with piano wire between two metal columns. And they also found through uh, financial records an online purchase for the piano wire. Another image was a cartoon strip with a last image someone's been held underwater. There was also a screenshot of a set of instructions titled How to Choke Your Partner Safely. There was a video of Scarlett's ex strangling herself with a leopard print dressing gown. She seems to pass out several times and at the end she says, I hope you enjoy it. A video which shows Scarlett and one of her ex-girlfriends and Scarlett strangling her with a thin piece of rope causing her to pass out and when she wakes up, the pair kiss. There was a meme with a rope, a gun, a knife and some tape with the caption, first date with me. Another photo was a bed, I think it was just something offline but the picture was off a bed with rose petals on it, rose petals, and it said the rose petals spelled out bruise my esophagus. There was also an image of a t-shirt that would have been worn by a random woman that had two speech bubbles which read you're cute and murder me. As I mentioned earlier, Ashlyn couldn't be a part of his trial. Her statement couldn't be used. And not being able to use that must have been really hard and put a lot of pressure on the police and prosecution. So just imagine how surprised and stunned the prosecution were when the defence counsel revealed the confession. The defence counsel got Ashlyn's confession and read it out to the jury. Now, the reason the defence counsel had brought this out against the defendant was because Scarlett wanted to explain why she was bragging about George's murder. She explained that it were all fantasy roleplay for a lover. And she said that Ashlyn had been manipulating her. And even though they lived 3,000 miles apart, she'd been absolutely terrified for her own safety if she didn't comply with what Ashlyn wanted. And even though they couldn't rely on Ashlyn's statement, and Evie had already flown back to America, in fact, I believe she was taken to the airport by the police, luckily, they did have the video of Eva saying how terrified she was of Scarlett. Which reminds me, I'm not quite sure if I've told you this, Eva, which had come over to the UK with Scarlett, was living with Scarlett, even at the time of the arrest, and they was apparently engaged. Scarlett's alleged mental problems, like a dissociative amnesia and fragmented personality, which let's not forget of not being officially diagnosed, were brought up in the courtroom by Scarlett. But her defence did not call a psychiatrist or therapist to support her claims. Let's not forget one of these fragmental personalities is a cat, and she's microchipped, and this were actually brought up in court, and she explained it. It's quite strange. It is very prominent when I'm expressing certain emotions. For example, the cat has a very strong association with joy, and I suppose the innate goodness. It is kind of a childlike innocence. With friends I know quite well who are aware of this part of me, I meow at them in greeting. Oh, and Scarlet quite aptly brags that she hates people that hurt animals. So that begs the question, why would she, someone that hates people that hurt animals and identifies as an animal, want to do what she did to a cat? And of course, smart old Scarlet had an answer for that. Don't forget, she was scared of Ashlyn, who were 3,000 miles away. She said that killing was something she very much didn't want. And of course she claimed that she did it to please Ashlyn. And she only pretended to enjoy it. And I'm st I'm, I'm stunned because she must be an incredible actor. Let's not forget in 20 minutes she laughed 29 times, smiled throughout and made poses with parts of it. But that is this entire court case. It's one big sob story for Scarlett Blake. 
we should all feel sorry for Scarlet Blake because despite being 3,000 miles away from Ashlyn, if she didn't do as she was told, she would make her hurt herself. There was a building up and air conditioning me to obey what she tells me to do. She would make me do things on video call like cut or setting a noose up from the ceiling and putting my head through it. To be honest, I don't really know what the defence counsel were going for here because while going through this case, I was fully expecting a claim for diminished responsibility. But they didn't call any experts, so they obviously weren't going for that. Unless they tried it and it didn't work and Scarlett decided to run with it anyway. I, I genuinely, it's bizarre. I genuinely don't get it. And frankly, from the way that they met on the Go Forum and the things that Scarlett had said to her par partners, not parents, partners, no part of me can believe that that was the case. I think, in my humble opinion, Scarlett and Ashlyn were both as bad as each other. If Scarlett genuinely felt like she were under Ashlyn's control, then it must have been because she wanted to feel like she were under Ashlyn's control, in my opinion. And as is always too often in these cases, Scarlett did all the way through the trial try and pass the blame on. As I said, Scarlett is quite the storyteller and her cross-examination went on for quite a while. And I'm not going through it because it went on for ages. <laughs> We'd be here all day. Comment down below if you do though, because I'm sure I can find find a way to just go through the entire cross-examination of Scarlett. Other quotes from the cross-examination include, Ashlyn was quite obsessive over how apparently I killed someone for her and how now she was dating a murderer. She seemed to enjoy it. According to Scarlett, on the night of George's murder, she was walking the streets of Oxford because she couldn't sleep, something she did quite often. However, obviously the prosecution said, no, you were out on the streets looking for a victim. And as we went through that timeline, each time she paused, the police said, and the prosecution said, when she pauses, she's looking at George. She's sizing him up. In regards to why she approached George, she said, I saw a person who seemed to be sat in the middle of an alleyway, which is typical indicative of someone not having the greatest times, and I was concerned. I was wondering if he had passed out, asleep, injured, in need of help. Well, I, I had a look. He didn't seem to be doing anything. So I went and poked him, on the shoulder, I think, or arm, and asked if he was okay. She goes on to mention what we talked about, and said that, George weren't all very coherent, he didn't seem to be in a good enough state to stand up, and so on. She, her entire account basically says that George was way too drunk, she was trying to look after him, and perhaps, maybe that's why he fell in river, he was a bit too drunk. Although the CCTV footage doesn't show that he was in that much of a state. She did, however, tell the court that it was her idea to go to Parsons Pleasure. Once they got there, they sat on top of a concrete block, and she starts to get concerned that he didn't want to go home. But at this point, she is wanting to go home, and she didn't think it would be a good idea to take him with her. She told him how to head in the direction he needed to head into, but before she left, she had a change of consciousness. She realised she was slipping back into her hold habits of drinking. Excessive. And at this very moment, at five o'clock in the morning, with a bottle of vodka in her hand, it dawned on her. But what I need to do is I need to stop drinking again. So George, that she just said is way too drunk to be out in a bar and he weren't coherent and couldn't walk, who's now sat on a concrete block outside of a river, she decided the best thing to do with his ball vodka would be to get him. Yeah, very caring indeed, Scarlett. Well thought out. Give the drunken guy a bottle of vodka outside of a river. Now to me, the answer to this next question is quite concerning. She asked if she'd hit him on the back of the head with a bottle of vodka. And she said, I'm pretty sure I didn't do that. I'm confident that did not happen. Now, as I said, there's pages after pages of her cross-examination. And as far as I can see, I've given you all the most important and all the interesting parts. If there's anything more to be said, it seems to me like Scarlett really knows about psychology. And she, she, she uses that. She, she, she uses it in a social setting and she uses it in court to try and get round things and and be above people with that knowledge, if you know what I mean. So when someone says something, she can say, well, that is actually a side of... You know what I mean? A bit rambly there, but you know what I mean. And throughout the case, the other thing is, throughout the case, she seems very arrogant to me. She, she does think like she's the smartest person in the room. So, pathology. There was no fractures to his voice box. 
so there were no signs that someone had forcibly squeezed his voice box. There was no evidence of him being restrained or violently essayed. He did have hemorrhaging at the back of his jaw and under his tongue. He also had a deep bruise about two centimeters across the back of his head. Now, let's bear in mind, I've already told you this was a narrative conclusion, so it wasn't conclusive. But it changed a bit in a report that was made just before the trial. The pathologist had been given extra information for the report, which included Ashton's confession and a video of Scarlett using a ligature high up around a partner's neck. So his new report changed a fair bit. And at first I was surprised and thought the defence is going to claim confirmation bias all over this, but they never did. And to be fair, it were put to the pathologist in court that, whoa, whoa, your original, support, your original claim was that it was not indicative of a third party, but you couldn't exclude it either. Is that still your position? And Dr. Logica said, no, because the new information now available to me has changed. I based that opinion on the information that was known to me in 2022. The case is not easy. That is why it was foolish of me to say from the postmortem at that time, without further information of the involvement of someone else, to say this person has died as a result of pressure being applied to the neck. Since the evidence from the postmortem externally was there were no injuries, but there was bruising that was noticed to the top of the neck and the face. I did acknowledge that bruising, because that bruising is in my original report. I didn't overinterpret that bruising at the time, because the evidence which presented to me did not support the definite possibility of someone else being involved in Mr. Carreno's death. The new information which was presented to me included a video of Miss Blake applying a ligature around a partner's neck and pushing this ligature high up. With that information, it made me review the significance of the bruising which I noted to both sides of the neck, high up just below the jaw. Therefore, I then believed this bruising could be more important than originally thought because the information of the time in 2022 was that there was no involvement of neck compression. This is an atypical case of neck compression. It is not a fatal neck compression, but it is a neck compression that could cause Mr. Carreno to lose consciousness. The cause of death is still that George drowned, but it's changed from it's likely an accident because he was drunk to it's likely he was rendered unconscious and then pushed into the water. With all that being said, on Friday the 23rd of February 2023, at Oxford Crown Court, a jury of five women and seven men reached a verdict after deliberating for just six hours after an eight-day-long trial. The verdict was 26-year-old Scarlett Blake is guilty of George Martin Carreno's murder. Scarlett Blake showed no emotion as she was found guilty, but she did smile briefly towards the public gallery as she left the dock. On Monday the 26th of February 2024, the judge sentenced Scarlett Blake. With this being a murder charge, there's only one sentence that's applicable, and that's life. The judge found the starting point of the minimum term, which is set by Parliament, to be 15 years. However, there were five aggravating factors. Major aggravating factors. First, with a significant degree of premeditation. The substantial planning. Although Scarlett didn't know George, picking him was very deliberate. There was a sexual motivation. And the fact that she returned to the scene, and not only did she return to the scene, she used the murder to brag, she bragged about the murder, and she used it to up her credibility. The only mitigating feature for Scarlett was her age, which was 23, because apparently that's quite young. So the judge sentenced Scarlett Blake to life with a minimum of 24 years, less 196 days, which is already spent on remand, leaving it at 23 years and 169 days. She then got a four months for the cat murder and two months for criminal damage, both to be run concurrent. Scarlett Blake is still receiving hormone therapy, but she's been kept in a Category A men's prison. Police have also admitted that if it weren't for Ashlyn Bell coming forward with the information, they would have never been able to solve this case. Scarlett would have pretty much got away with it. And I don't feel like we've talked about George very much, especially not since the beginning, so I'm going to give you his family tribute. He studied electrical engineering, where his dedication and passion were evident. In every project he undertook, manifesting in a deep commitment to innovation. He dreamed of a future where he could make a difference with his skills and ambition, aspiring to create and build a better world. His life was imbued with love of music, 
photographer, reading and sports. He played the guitar skillfully and radiated kindness and humour among those lucky enough to have known him. Being a triplet brother, George shared not only blood ties with his brothers, but was also their best friend. His friends adored him. He had an affable heart and sense of humour that filled every space with laughter and complicity. George, with his caring and friendly nature, lit up any place, always spreading joy with his wit and contagious curiosity. With a great sense of humour, his immense desire to live and enjoy life made him a bit of a special being. Always ready to help and listen to others, he was above all an incredibly good person. And that's all I've got for you. But I have got a tribute of my own. While I've been gone, since I haven't been doing true crime, we've lost one of our own. Christine Short. Now, I'm not going to sit here and pretend me and Christine were best friends, but Christine did message me on the All I'm Saying Is Facebook page, and we did have a few conversations. And it genuinely deeply saddened me when I'd heard that Christine had passed away. I do miss her, and I know her family do, especially Aaron. Or maybe Aaron. Sorry, dude. And as I said, she's one of ours. So while I carry Christine in my heart, I also need you to listen to this next part very carefully. If you don't every other time, please do it at least this time. All I'm saying is, I love you. Take care of yourself, take care of those around you, and I'll see you real soon. Bye.